Here's a slightly more complicated mechanical system, the quarter car suspension. It's called the quarter car suspension not because we uh, only want to have cars that are made out of quarters, but because it represents about a fourth of the car. And it represents about a fourth of the car because we're dealing with one tire, one shock absorber, uh, and one other spring that's attached from the frame to the axle. So in this case, we have a figure that looks a little bit like this after we've abstracted the system. And again, we need to denote directions. So we're going to name one state as y, and we expect y to be positive in this direction, x to be positive in this direction, and we have a reference, r, which conveniently stands for road. So here we have something like a tire that's bouncing on the road, and then the shock absorber and spring are dampened uh, above the actual weight of the car. So these values have some masses. Usually m2 is going to be much, much greater than m1 here, but the wheel does have some mass, and so we need to consider that when it's springing around we have some values that correspond to each of these springs as well. So the stiffness of the two springs, as well as the amount that the dash pot B is going to be resisting changes in velocity. So now our next step is to decompose the system. Again, not because this is an episode of CSI, but because the advantage of a linear system is that we can decompose the component parts, solve them independently, and then get an answer at the end that's going to give us the value of the system. We can recompose that answer in order to find out any value of the system at any time. So we begin by writing down the two masses, M1 and M2, here in our free body diagram. And we're going to, instead of actually going ahead and trying to write the forces down what they actually are, I just want to denote the two values of the forces, or the three values in the case of M1, that will be acting on these masses. So we have two values acting on M2, they'll be acting down. Three values on M1, two acting upwards, one acting down. And this is how we denoted motion on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So let's go ahead and label these, F1, F2, and F3. And again, we've made sure that F1 and F2 correspond correctly on the two diagrams. So let's review the kinds of values, the kinds of equations that the spring and the dash pot obey. So the spring is F equals K of X. So the force is proportional to the amount that the spring stretches, X. So here we have F1 is KS times the difference between Y and X. So if you look over on the left-hand side, KS, when it's at rest, is not going to be having any force at all. So that's, when the, uh, that's the difference between Y and X aren't really moving. But as you make that value bigger, the force is going to be slightly larger. And so as you stretch it apart, it's going to be trying to pull M2 back to M1 or pull M1 up to M2, depending on the stiffness of the other spring. So that's why the forces act basically in towards the middle of the spring. So if you make the value of X smaller and keep the Y value the same, then you're going to see a larger force exerted. So let's take that and substitute it in. We have now the damper of the dash pot. So remember that these are where the force is proportional to the rate of change of distance. So a dash pot doesn't have any force when it's not moving, but when it does move, you see that the force is proportional to the velocity. So here we have F2 is B times Y dot minus X dot. So what's the difference in the rates of velocities of Y and of the values of the masses at Y and X? And F3, because it's another spring, here we take the difference between X and the road. So if we think of the road as zero, then we just have KW times X. So with these three values, now we can write that M1 X1 double dot is F1 plus F2 minus F3. And likewise, M2 X2 double dot is going to be equal to minus F1 minus F2. So we can substitute in those values for the actual forces to get something that's going to be our equations of motion. So for the first value, you should see something like this. And for the second value, here. So with these as our equations of motion, we now have the ability to describe the rate of change of how X1 and X2 double dot are going to be changing based on input values or the existing state values.